I'm broke. <laughs> I'm tired. I can't take it anymore. Life of an architect. <laughs> I mean, you could have said you're broken. <laughs> well, broken. I'm broken. Broke, I'm broken. Broke. In. Uh huh. You broke in. <laughs> yeah. Uh. You're an old horse. Yes, I get it. You're, you're like a fine, fine uh, leather jacket, Cormac. That's what you are. I was talking to a friend of mine today, and he was asking me, what do I feel was my most successful project? Mm. And we came, we started talking. It was like all across the board. It ended up being like two and a half hour phone call. Okay. And it, it was kind of like all across the board. We we hit like every conversation about architecture that you can imagine. But please lay down on the couch and. and... <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that was interesting is, it, I I think, and even though I'm extraordinarily happy with the way that this particular project came out architecturally, yeah. The reason why I think this particular project that I had selected as part of this was the whole process behind the project. And he was just like, see, that's what I'm looking for. He goes, I'm looking for jazz. And I'm like, explain. And he's just like, yeah, seriously. <laughs> he goes, I'm looking for an ensemble of different characters, different ideas, different things, people, whatever, that come together with their own bit of knowledge, experience, expertise, uh, mm -hmm. passions, you know, the, the soul that they bring to what they can offer. And when it comes together, you may think that this is like a weird ragtag bunch of people to put together, but when it comes together, it just makes jazz. And I was like, all right, mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, <laughs> okay. I get it. All right. And and so we used that as kind of like the disclaimer for what we thought was, whether it was the most collaborative, the most immersive, you know, whatever it was that made that project, like your favorite project, your most memorable project, the best project and whatnot. The, and the one you to, wanted to show up to work for. How about that? <laughs> and the one that you wanted to show up to work for, but because there's definitely projects that that are slowly killing you, and you're like looking for excuses of why you don't want to show up because it's gotten to that point. And maybe maybe yeah. a lot of projects get to that point, but man, there are some that just never get to that point, and right. you just want to go to work every day, and you are excited about working on it. And you might be doing something really mundane, but you have a, a view of the bigger picture. Which is which is you're filling in all those details that are going to yeah. make it sing, that are going to make it jazz, as you say. Exactly. This is exactly. this is how you speak. Yeah. And and you know, and I looked at it and I was like, there was there's a handful of projects that I got immersed into the the daily life of whoever that user would be. Look and at you and the empathy. That's you. <laughs> but I mean it was it's just like <laughs> Especially us, the projects that we've worked on, we've worked on public schools, we've worked on like rec centers, we've, we've worked on all of these different like civic projects, right? Yeah. So there is a user virtually from every walk of life that's going to be using these buildings. There are the users who are going to be there like every single day, teachers in the classroom, custodial staff, food staff, all of these different things. And there's, and so... I was talking about like kind of like my love affair for academic work and things like a lot of the K through 12 stuff and talked about how immersive you can get in there. Sometimes I, I, I've felt with like resistance in a bunch of these different projects where they're like, remember, this isn't a very wealthy like school district. So, you know, they don't need high design in you're like, wait, what, what, you know what I mean? Isn't that just the, they you know, just like, mean expensive when they say that. It, yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. But 
so for me, and I don't know if we want to get into like specific specifics, but to me in, in, in like right there mm-hmm. is a picture of the building and right there and there are the awards that I won for it. <clears throat> you know, not I'm shaking like, my head because Beep. your finger bends in very weird ways. I always have to. <laughs> it's all, you, have, you have very creepy creepy fingers <laughs> and for those of you who are not watching this on video right. you're missing this oh come on there's the thumbnail right there with your <laughs> but uh. so he was he was just like well what made it that that project special <clears throat> And, and can I ask why he's asking this? Is it is it because he wants to talk about a special project that he's worked on? Or is it no. because he hasn't experienced it? Or like, He doesn't feel like he's... Ex- he, he really didn't feel like he's experienced it. Okay. And he's like the one... I, I, I was guessing that, but I thought the other yeah. angle might be fun to, to throw out there. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it would have been. And when it was interesting, because I, I sat there for a few minutes and I'm like, you know, have I had my jazz project? Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I thought about all the different projects that I've had throughout my 20 plus years career so far and growing. And I've had a lot of different projects and a lot of different scales, big monster projects, $500 million budget down to, uh, you know, a 20 by 20 maintenance shed. <laughs> right. And I always yes. go back to, I always Welcome go back to, to the first one. That's the first one. That was my very first project management job. Oh, man. It's a 20 by 20 maintenance shed for the yeah. city of St. Petersburg in a dog park. First real project. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and, and so the project that I was referring to was the E.L. Wilson Biophilia Center. It's in Freeport, Florida. And the thing that I enjoyed so much about it, it was a part of my life for well over two years. And when I say it was a part of my life, it wasn't just, oh my gosh, you know, I've been doing this project for two years. No, it was, I was immersed in it. I was a part of these, these people's lives. And I was trying to learn what it was that they do because it was a gamut of things. I mean, this is basically, it's the Negosi plantation and it is a foundation that is essentially restoring North Florida's ecosystem back to kind of a pre-colonial uh, stage. And so there's the the founder behind all of this. He bought up all of this land and he was taking all of this land and he was taking, you know, he, he basically bought all of this, what was old longleaf pine forest that then was basically mowed down and then it was turned into basically quick grow southern yellow pine or a a type of uh, white pine that grew quickly so that they could harvest it for paper. Mm-hmm. And so rows and rows and rows of paper mill grade uh, pal- um, uh, pine trees. And so he bought, he, he initially bought 53,000 acres. Yeah, that, that. But it was, it was, but he strategically bought that 53,000 acres that abutted state forest lands, protected wildlife lands, as well as lands that were owned by the federal government for Eglin Air Force Base. But it was all of this continuous, there was almost 1 million square acres of continuous like forest land. Sure, there's a few interruptions of like, you know, roads and things like that, but he was basically but it's protected. It's like it was it's not all protected. Get, yeah. None of that stuff will get developed around it. So it's right. It's got this buffer, this amazing buffer. And so one of one of the key factors that he wanted to do was one thing is like he he made a he made a refuge for the gopher tortoise and hired some of the foremost experts on gopher tortoise rescue because. In the state of Florida, gopher tortoises were protected. And if you were working on a project and there were gophers tor- gopher tortoises on there, you either had to do one of two things, not build, or you had to have them relocated to another location. 
Wow. And there was they they were heard way too many stories about one day gopher tortoises were there and another day they disappeared. Like yeah. sure they disappeared. Like where did they go? <laughs> they like <laughs> right. they're tortoise, they don't move that fast. And developers were basically builders and developers were basically eradicating and to a mm -hmm. point of near extinction of the native Florida gopher tortoise. And so this was one of the many places, also the black bear, also the, the Florida panther and, and, a, and a bunch of other things. So that was kind of one mission. Another mission was to restore it to its pre-colonial days. And so what he was doing was, you know, cutting down all of the fast growth trees and replanting um, in a very strategic way all these long leaf pines and then intermixing them with the the short grow and, and I don't really I can't I'm blanking on what they were they were actually called but they were just they were trees that the trees that were there when he bought the land were maybe between five and seven years old you know that's mm -hmm. how quickly they were just it's a rotating crop of okay of of basically saplings and maybe like small barrel trees that then were replaced. And then, but the interesting thing about it was, is that, you know, they, he did like control burns and cut these trees down with some pretty amazing equipment that, and I, I'm sure you've seen them. They're like almost like a backhoe type, you know, thing that basically goes and grabs the tree and cuts the tree off at that. And then it basically is carrying the tree off and then it like, you know, yeah. stacks it and stuff. One of the things about why I feel like that project was successful is a lot of the planning for the project was me immersing myself in what they do. I was there helping them with control burns. I was there helping cut down trees. Wow. I was there helping them protect pitcher plants, which are the plants that look like a pitcher like not a picture plant, like as in taking pictures, but a big picture plant that looks like it's a picture, a what? picture of water. <laughs> I'm going to have to look this up. You're going to have to look this up. <laughs> yeah, the, look up your, a picture. Your hand, your hand waving in the air is not happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then in, and so as he's, as he's developing kind of this conservancy, this, this restoration of the ecosystem, one of the things that his mission was to basically create a space for environmental education. And it was, it was kind of a one of a kind educational opportunity for this area, because what it was, was for a week elementary. So basically three different times throughout your, your lifetime in the public school system. There's a couple of different Okaloosa County, Walton County, all of these like counties around this area near Freeport, Florida, would basically, they would go and as an elementary school, middle school and high schooler would go there for a week long immersion program of essentially being, be an ecologist for a week and learning how to be good stewards of the land. And it was such an amazing program, such an amazing mission. And you couldn't help but want to immerse yourself into this, everything about what this was. And so it was interesting because when they first asked us, because here's how we stumbled on it. We were, it was me and my old college roommate. And we were, because we knew people who worked with this guy, they were like, hey, would you help, help us write a request for proposal from or request for qualifications from all of these architects we want to write this we want to get an architect to help us with all of these with all of the construction projects that we want to do on this thing and we're like sure yeah we'll we'll help out and so we did and you, you, know, didn't, he, you didn't say like wait look, I, i'm i'm yep. an architect <laughs> yep. so, well first of all at the time we weren't we were okay. we were unlicensed uh, we were doing like some residential at the time and that was it. And so that's what we could do. And we were just, we, there were things that we were doing to kind of like get by and stuff. And so, so when we, we helped them write it, we were like, thank you very much. They paid us for our time and all of that other stuff. And then they started getting in their, all of these proposals and they, 
then we get a phone call and they're like, hey, Cormac, uh, we haven't seen your proposal yet. And you're like, well, what do you mean? It's just like, well, we were assuming that you were, you know. Cormac. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> like, like, so we, you know, we, we, we were hoping that because you know this project and you know what we're trying to accomplish that they're like you know you would submit do i need to spell it out for you well we didn't (laughs) because we weren't licensed and this was a commercial project (laughs) and so okay and so i reached out to a friend who said that i asked i was like hey would you be willing to partner with us to to go after this project and she was literally like like holding all the proposals just so you can get yours in at this point because they they received them all and funny enough they did (laughs) And it was interesting who we were up against. Why did too. they go through all that if they just wanted to work with you? That's hilarious. Well, it wasn't even that. And so here's one thing that I sort of wish that I could have had on tape because I do not remember one millisecond of my, as they said, impassioned speech about what we, what our vision for their project was Mm. and how Mm. we would be able to help them achieve their vision, their goals for this project. That's when they knew. (laughs) And I, apparently, (laughs) apparently for like quite, what probably to me felt like two hours, but was probably around the neighborhood of like five to 10 minutes, um, was this very impassioned speech about the project. And, you know, what our qualifications were to be able to accomplish it and the team that we had assembled and all of these other things. And they literally said that the reason why was not because of, because we were up against some amazing architects, some architects that I, I love their work. And you were like, you should definitely pick them. (laughs) Fanboying. I don't know if I'm like, should should I say who we were up against? I don't see why not. So we competed. So we shortlisted three people. Us, Mm -hmm. Methun, Mm -hmm. and Lake Flato. Oh, geez. And I'm like, okay, I rule over Lake Flato's work. Sure. And we beat Lake Flato. We beat Methun. Methun is like a the relationship. Methun yeah. is the master at uh, this kind of work. Like, why, yeah. why, why would you not pick them? But they picked us, and yeah. and for the next, your fees were really low. <laughs> yeah, probably that too. <laughs> um, but for the next, but but I mean, we so we lived so we lived there for one, and so we were yeah. easily accessible. We didn't have to like fly in from Seattle or from Texas. Texas. We (laughs) literally just drove down the road and we were there. Right. And we, when when we say we lived there though, but we lived there. We lived with them. We ate with them. We told stories with them. We became part of them. And it was such, it would. I'm going to do the the thing. Look at. It was so symbiotic. It was. You know, and, and so it was jazz because we all brought all of our different experiences. It, it was so funny is because of the, the, the initial sketches that I had done for the building, just based off of the program exercises had, would, I, I don't have them anymore. In fact, I don't have anything from that project anymore. It was, it was a it was back in the day when you do do did a lot of things by hand, and then um, in the model that I built. Oh my god, the model that I built was just it was amazing. Um, <laughs> I mean, if I do say What's so, what's funny myself, is your memories of these things are probably better than the actual things. Oh no, I'm just saying no. this. The, so <laughs> the model was I, I I loved that model, and and I spent a lot of time building that model. That was so if. So like so I'm I, wondering about your fees here. Yeah, I'm still. I, this is oh, just cranking in my back. My, let's the back let's of my just mind. say it's like, oh my let's god. Just say there was pennies. a reason. There was a reason why we went out of business. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, okay. was pro, was was that? But because yeah. I spent so much time on that model. I mean, I you know, literally blood, sweat, and tears for that one. And but it was like it. It was probably the last real model that I ever built. Hmm. And it was probably the best model that I had ever built, ever. 
I mean, I spent a lot of time in the research that I did to make the water look like water and all of the other things to just like, cause, cause we built a three acre pond, which was a retention pond, but it made it look like the building was kind of floating over the water. Mm-hmm. And we'll definitely put a link in the show notes to, to this so that everybody can kind of take a look at it and you can be as harsh as you want on the architecture because, to be quite honest with you, this, I was a Don't kid. mess with Cormac's jazz, jazz No, I even, I even told my friend, I was just like, <laughs> I don't think it was the best architecture I ever did. I mean, I was a kid. I was do. I, I didn't know a lot. And, of course. But I also... Every building learned. that we do is is not going to be the best building because there's oh. the next building usually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be better. But it was yeah. the whole cohesive experience of this like pure totally understanding exactly what the program was like because I was living the program I was just like Mm. I know you know it's like I may not know what they need but I know I can give them what they need and Mm. because I it's just like oh well you need like this is the kind of space that you need and it was it was such a cool place and so the great thing about it is, is that now it's, uh, it, it opened in 08, I believe. And now we're in the second decade of this building, educating students and growing and expanding. And now they have a, a Raptor center and the ongoing in, in, unfortunately, the developer who started this had, had passed. But he, like, he knew that this project was going to outlive him. I had the opportunity to meet E.O. Wilson and present him with a watercolor that we did for the project. And it was just, it was amazing to, like, just sit down and meet this guy that the world reveres as this foremost biologist that is just this awesomely cool down-home Alabama boy who just was like the nicest dude you could ever imagine. It's like p- doctorates from Harvard are tripping over themselves to talk to this guy. And he's just a country boy at heart. And it was so like, the whole thing was just one of these projects that if I don't do another project like that, and again, like I said, it's not really about the architecture. I, I mean, I'm I'm proud of it. Is mm-hmm. there... Now that I'm what uh, another two decades later from yeah. from that project, that I absolutely know that I can do better architecture. Sure, but I don't know if I'm going to ever have a better experience in architecture because it, it was, was formative too. I mean, it, it was just one of those things that made you the architect that you are. Oh, right? absolutely right, going through that process and. A- It's interesting, right? Because when we get into the corporate architecture world and there are project managers and there are the contracts and and, and the game is completely different, right? It's like you get penalized for spending more time on a project. You can't live the project (laughs) like you did. It's like less is better. It's like it's not better for the building. Well, less is better. Believe me, it's better for our bottom line. And and you get into these these traps. And I mean, and maybe the way you did it is actually a trap. I mean, I'm sure there's some balance to be achieved here, right? Because it ruined me for. I mean, like you said, you can't you can't continue. It's not a sustainable business to do it the way that you did it potentially, right? So. There's a balance to be achieved here, but it was so like you wouldn't trade that experience for anything, right? No. I mean, and that is what you're actually remembering is is how it's not. Yeah. I'm sure it wasn't all amazing, but it. But when you look back on it, yeah, it was so formative for you, yeah, to become an architect that it's it just it's really special. This episode is made possible with support from Chaos Enscape. This is the perfect time to set good intentions and resolutions for the months ahead. Whether you aim to solve your design challenges faster, run your projects more smoothly, make quicker decisions, or share immersive walkthroughs with the click of a button, here's some good news. You won't need any resolutions. Chaos Enscape has the best 3D workflow solution. Chaos Enscape is the industry-leading real-time visualization plugin that is 100% fast, 
100% easy, and fully integrated into your favorite design tools. It is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. Starting today, you can get a 20% discount on fixed and floating annual licenses. Just head to chaos-enscape.com and use code RES24 at checkout. That's chaos-enscape.com using code RES24 at checkout to supercharge your design workflow. Thanks to Chaos Enscape so much for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. It's interesting because we've said this a couple of times in some of the recent episodes about the experiencing of the place so that you kind of really understand what it was. And when we were supposed to write a, an article about the experience of a building and I packed up and used the weekend to drive up there and, and actually experience the place so that I could really give an informed decision. And it's so interesting that, you know, when you talk about like corporate architecture, as part of this conversation that we were having about jazz architecture was the, are we form builders or placemakers? You know, when we're placemakers, we're really, you know, it's, it's like this, that building could be only one place. It's that mm. place at that time. And that's the right response for it. That's placemaking. If it's an object that could be picked up and moved to another place or another place or another place, and it just looks yeah. like whatever, then that's form building. And, and a lot of times the corporate architecture really is just about form making. It's, it's about, you know, like, how do you, our, 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 our conversation even kind of devolved into like, you know, and why, why most projects aren't jazz, why they are, you know, just there. There's they're, so much, so much working against that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so when I said that I was ruined after that project, I really did find it because I, so this was when I stopped, the project was um, in construction administration. Then 2008 happened and everybody, you know, who knows what happened in 2008 knows that, you know, most people were architects were going out of business or losing their jobs or, or basically trying to shore up the job that they had to, so that they don't lose it. And, and, and so it was a, it was a really tough time. And so because we went out of business and so 2008 was one of the reasons why we went out of it, not just necessarily our, our choices of how we spent money or, or, you know, little, little fees that we actually spent. And I could definitely go through like some other conversations about like what happened on this project of just like, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that sob story for myself or for a later <laughs> conversation, but it, you know, I was ruined because I expected too much out of every project since then. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, I, I expect too much out of projects because I want them to be that fulfilling. I want it to like be the jazz that it was. And there's jazz moments on projects where, you know, the team comes together and they really are clicking and the design is really evolving and everybody's involved. And, you know, there's, there's this you know, symbiotic relationship, the relationship that you were talking about of being able to like achieve so many things, both in design, in camaraderie, in, in all of these other things that, you know, are, are rare in projects in a way sometimes. And, and so you have those moments, but I've, <laughs> Like I said, I've had that one moment and I'm okay that it, if it's just a moment, you know, that just that one moment, but I'm always expecting every, every project after to, to deliver that moment. And it's it interesting doesn't. because you still have that desire and that, that fire to think it's possible yeah. right? and and what's what's crazy to me is that that it hasn't happened in so long because you're talking about a project from 2008 <laughs> that yeah. really made its mark it's an right. indelible mark at this point yeah that you haven't been completely beaten down with right. all of the other crap that you've experienced from now to then because True. because again you're, you're going back and you're saying that was the project you're not saying yeah. any project since then has be has taken the spot of that project 
And so you've had a lot of experiences between 2008 and now. In, and and you're still like you're still hungry to to yeah. see and you still ha- see the potential for that to happen. Well, what's and the point of doing? It kind of hasn't happened, but you're well, still but you're still yeah. you're still there. Like I think that that's pretty incredible because I think a lot of people don't have that anymore. Yeah. And and that's why I'm saying this. I mean, I think it's actually really incredible that you still do have that. Yeah. Because there are so many people who are just like, they've been beaten down and beaten down. And we know what this profession does to people. Oh, yeah, it eats yeah. people up and it spits them out. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's the wrong way. It chews people up and it spits people out. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of older generations of people and, and just toxic people who eat their young in this yeah. profession, right? And and so there's a lot of stuff that, that literally happens to a lot of people. And here you are with still this this optimism. I think it's, it's pretty incredible. I feel like I could be easily jaded. But then I think about Cynical, it. Cynical, jaded, yeah, for sure. And But I still feel like... Like, what's the point in doing it if you can't, if, if like you don't expect the joy, what the hell's the point, right? But there is this kind of, uh, so I said all that stuff that I just said, and and yet like architects continue to be the optimists at the table, right? And we, (laughs) I'm patting us, patting us on the back right now. We, we are the one, the champions of the vision. Yeah. And yeah. the what if and the what could be and the potential. And I I find that incredibly interesting, even though we've had the experience like you I know the experience that you oh, yeah. the experiences that you've had since then. Like oh, yeah. there, there's a lot of really, really, really bad stuff, right? And here you are, you're still the champion of what could be. Let's see. So uh twenty twenty four. We've been doing this show for twelve years. You have been on, we've both been on our, each other's journey of experiences of projects and clients and leaving firms and firm cultures and all of these other things. And we know what the profession's like, but we're still doing this because we still do have that passion to, (laughs) right? (laughs) and it, it, I was, when we were talking today, and again, I, like I said, it was like a two and a half hour long conversation. I mean, I felt so giddy and so charged after having this conversation with a like-minded person who really like, they're like, he was like, but, but doesn't architecture rob you of some of the things that you can do, it takes you from your family and all of these other things? I'm like, it can if we let it. And we do often let it. I was like, but also if you think about it, like going on a vacation with your family doesn't have to be divorced. And I was, I was doing this soliloquy, doesn't have to be divorced from, from architecture and stuff. I was, I was using these examples. I was like, you know, we used to go on these drives where we would go on these like little history tours and follow the, follow the footsteps of George Washington or John Madison or Thomas Jefferson and visit their homes in East you know, Coaster. It, yeah. Absolute East Coaster. It's like, <laughs> or, or follow in the, like, they, they actually have a John Wilkes Booth trail. And you can go to like all of like these pivotal events in American history that revolve around the basically the plot assassination of Lincoln and the capture of John Wilkes Booth. But almost every single bit of that. There's all of that history, but every single bit of that has architecture. Hmm. It, there's architecture involved with every single step of that way. It's let's go to Ford's theater. Let's go across the street to the tavern where they tried to save Lincoln. Let's go and see the barn that, which is is not there, but the barn that they captured John Wilkes Booth. Let's go see Dr. Mudd's house where he tried to patch up John Wilkes Booth. Or where the tavern that they did the plotting and all of that other stuff. And as as much as everybody's like immersed in the history of this, all of these events, and I am too, I'm also immersed into here's the architecture. Like here is, 
here is the placemaking that set the stage for all of these memories this this combined story not yet, exactly yeah. this this story <laughs> that people tell that thousands and thousands of people have been telling their students and everything else throughout the past couple hundred years or hundred and a half years and all of that is immersed in architecture but and so i was just like as much as we let architecture we say that architecture like it kind of robs us of our of our life and stuff I'm like it also enriches our lives it also is like a part of of the things that we do and so like i, I was looking i was talking about it, i was like every time we go on a on a trip it's either covert or over architecture tour it all really depends <laughs> like when i say hey we're gonna go not and so do... sneaky anymore well sometimes it's like you know hey we're gonna go to the frank lloyd wright trail well they know that if we're gonna yeah. do the frank lloyd wright trail <laughs> it's all about architecture or then it's yeah. like hey we're gonna do the we're gonna follow the the footsteps of john wilkes booth they may think "Ooh, history I'm thinking, ooh, history wrapped in architecture or architecture wrapped in history, <laughs> right, you know? Right. So there's the covert right. of my overt actions. Um, I know what I'm doing. How many people in architecture get to experience a jazz project out of, out of all the people and all the projects that actually happen? How many do you think feel that? That's a hard question because it, we were taught, we were, you know, we were sitting here and we were talking about when, when we were having this conversation about the jazz architect, we were talking about all of these different places that had to have a greater connection with the client, with the land, with everything else. And he had brought up, and I know that you, this is near and dear to your heart too. He brought up the Salk Institute and he talked about the experience. He was like the, the spiritual experience that he had at the Salk Institute. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you don't achieve that without jazz, right? And there are those projects around there that have that kind of like really great feeling. But then there's the, the background buildings. And I'm wondering, it's like, you know, I wonder if like, do the background buildings, do the, the infill projects, do the, do, do people find joy in doing those projects where it, it is as satisfying as like designing the salt? I don't, I don't think so, man. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> there may be some level of satisfaction in certain parts right. of doing that project, but I don't think it's the whole thing. I don't think it's a, as big of a deal as, as you're making it. So then let me ask you this. Found. If, do you think that architecture or those built those types of projects and stuff would be better if we did treat them as a jazz project as that trying to it's just like we know that you know you you'd said it is like you know projects aren't like projects are based off of metrics they're based off of profitability they're based based off of like you know how quickly we can get the turnaround you know you know I was I was I was talking, I was likening architecture projects to tables at a restaurant. It's not for you to just like sit around all day long and be that one person sitting there. They want monopolize you know, the table. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, chop, get chop, 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 get out. You know, it's like, we need this to keep turning this profit. We need to keep rolling. It's just like, we're not going to earn money off of serving one dude who's just going to be sipping coffee all day long. And, free refills, right. And, and the, that's what, you know, so that's what kind of almost dilutes, you know, when we, when we struggle with trying to tell people, um, you know, the value of an architect when we're, you know, we, when we somewhat devalue our own contributions to the built environment by doing the, you know, chop, chop, get out kind of projects. I, I think this is the whole, like, bring your whole self to work. I mean, it's a lame way to say it, yeah. um, but not enough people do bring their whole self to work. They don't yeah. bring their passion to work with them because there's a lot of things outside of work that are affecting that as well. It's not just work. Yeah. But I think on any budget, on any project, you can make it a great project. Mm -hmm. I really think you can. And it, it on some level, you have to protect yourself from 
the things that can bring you down and you have to separate yourself or compartmentalize in some ways. I think, you know, you could have a toxic client, you could have a bad schedule, you could have a terrible budget, you could have like a, a list of materials that you're like, how am I going to make something good out of CMU? Or And, <laughs> right. and I'm, I I don't want to be bad down on CMU. You, you actually, absolutely can do amazing mm -hmm. architecture with all kinds of seemingly simple building materials, right? Right. Look at look at what you can accomplish with the brick. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but 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 the the thing is is like, there's so many things affecting us and everybody on our team that if there are slight misalignments there, it it's easy to lose that. Mm -hmm. And so so to answer your question, could you do it? Absolutely. The potential I think is there on every single project. Yep. Like your first maintenance building to your jazz project to the project you're working on today there's absolutely the opportunity and the potential to do that but can we bring ourselves to show up to do that and i think that goes through cycles and there's so many variables and i think that's where it's hard is like actually putting all those pieces together in the symphony that it needs to be yeah. even if it's a low budget fast turnaround project right i mean right be because there, there are the realities of the real world, and and I mean, somebody's, somebody could have their best friend die in a car crash, or their parents, or a kid problem, or a pet, or like, and all of these things work their way in oh, yeah. and affect yeah. our our day to day performance, right? right? So, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had a project that was a really, really difficult process? And that you could interpret that however you want, <laughs> turn out amazing, even though it was a really, really difficult process. Because you talked about your biophilia center, right? right. And it was the process right? and, and the outcome, I think probably yeah. both together I, and the client and the location and everything working together. Have you ever had a project where it was like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to go to work. And then the end... It still turned out, yeah, of something you were incredibly proud and of. And there was, so I'll I'll go and take it just one step further. It's like there was a project, and has been several projects actually, that difficult client, difficult schedule, like difficult circumstances, pushing my own knowledge of design interpretation, pushing my knowledge of, of uh, tectonics, of like trying new things with, you know, the way that I was uh, detailing things and, and all of these things. And it was such, it was a bear of a project. And, you know, there was a point in time where I, was like, I can't do this anymore. And I thought it was going to break me and, and it didn't break me. And I just, it, but it did beat me down. And I was just like, I don't ever want to see this project again. You know, <laughs> and, and so I will say that this is kind of, this is kind of cool. And if I get it a little choked up, whatever, but in the, what was it? 2019 AIA convention, when we went out to uh, Vegas and I took my son with me cause he just, my oldest son and he just graduated high school and we did our cross country tour back and we were going to skip St. Louis. We were going to just drive right on past it. But I was like, no, let's go. And like, you know, we, we went and we went up into the arch and, and all of those other things. And I was like, let's do some touristy things in St. Louis. But I wasn't going to go see my project because I was just like, had this like love hate relationship with it. I'm not saying what it is. I, I did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> It was just, and I was like, I had this love hate relationship with it because there was, there was some like bad, there's just like, there was, it was, it was rough. It was hard. Yeah. And I went back and the way he was, you know, I was just like, you know what? I, I flew back and forth to St. Louis like several times a month, um, left the family for a couple of days a month and went all of this stuff. And here's, here's my son. He's now old enough, you know, let me, let me show him, like, there was a lot of times where I would like just take them to my projects because they were local. And so it was yeah. good to kind of like take them to these projects, but we hadn't seen any of these projects because they're a thousand plus miles away. 
And so I was like, well, let's go do this. And so I, it, it was the building and it was a pedestrian bridge. And so I parked on the side where we could walk over the pedestrian bridge and engage the building the way that it was supposed to be. And so now a couple of years later, a couple of years post construction, no, it was just like, there was like trepidation at best, you know, to see this thing. It was just, and f- finally we visited it and I was just like, holy shit, this turned out great. I was just like, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> you just erased all those old memories. <laughs> I was just like, wow. Like, like, all right now, you know, and, and so do you know what a bike trough is? Like, yeah, yeah. I, on the side of the stairs. On the side of the right. stairs. So yeah. they had these bike troughs on the sides of all of their stairs and stuff. And I, and I sat around and then they asked us, you know, Hey, we want to add some bike troughs to these. And I, and I've never done a bike trough before. You know, I, I never had a project like that, that had that much of a elevation change this whole project them. this i know this project it's yeah. a big project yeah you're talking about the bike troughs and we're <laughs> and we're talking about the bike trough because i sat and i looked at the operation of their bike troughs throughout this project and i was just like they're they're walking with their bike and they're leaning their bike way over because if they because of the way the proximity of the trough itself to the handrail that the that yeah. the their their pedals and their cranks would hit the hit the um handlebar the hand, like everything, you know, like everything would hit it i'm like get in the way there's got to be a yeah. better way to do this and so i redesigned the bike trough in a way that you didn't have to lean the bike over you didn't have to lean over to like not knock the the you know the bike apart and and i sat there in this courtyard in this little plaza this you know that had multiple different elevation changes and all this other stuff and watched people first actually use the bike troughs um and then look to see how successful the bike troughs were i was just like yeah like even the little things <laughs> sweet ex- bike trough. yeah it was just like even the little things excited me i was just That's like cool. yeah this and then i looked at it and i was just like <laughs> This is actually holding up pretty well. I mean, you know, a couple, you know, like, I mean, it was like only four years later, but it was still four years later of abuse. And we know how academic spaces can be. I mean, they get abused left and right. And this was actually holding up pretty well. I mean, there was decisions that were made that like, it, it was hard to convince clients to do those decisions, but they made, but when they made those decisions, it worked out for the better. Like, People hate corner guards. Everybody hates corner guards, right? But like, I, I kept looking at like the way that their corner guards were used in like all of their other buildings and they stopped the corner guard short. And then just below the corner guards, the walls were beat to Thought crap. Yeah. And it was yeah. because the buffers were beating up the corners and all this other stuff. I'm like, you're going to go for the gusto of this. Just do full height, you know. Uh, corner guards and I'm like walking around our building four years later and so there's four years of maintenance on this thing and the corners still look good the walls still look bike good bike troughs and, and corner guards bike troughs and corner guards I mean <laughs> I mean I, I actually really like the building itself but you know they it, really tie the room together Cormac. <laughs> exactly it's like but those but those corner guards and those bike troughs like Chef's kiss, man. I mean, those were Chef's kiss. That's those good. were, you know, the best thing about it. I had a I had a community center project that I. It was a big team, right? So I'm definitely not taking credit for the whole thing, but it was. We had a difficult principal in the firm. Mm-hmm. We had a difficult budget. We had a political client. It was like a district supervisor for L.A. County and L.A. County is divided into all these districts. And so it was all of and it was an unincorporated area that was getting this new community center. And so there was all of this community involvement where they have never gotten any resources before because they're unincorporated. They don't have a mayor. They don't have a city council. They don't get a budget allocated. So they're going to the district supervisor. They're raising their their taxes basically to pay for this project for their community. And so there's all these politics involved because it's mm. you're dealing with with those kind of people, mm-hmm. 
and uh, it's a big piece of land and a small budget, and there's nine different agencies that we have to get approval <laughs> from because <laughs> there's a food uh, component the and it's it's yeah. unincorporated and it's you got to get this permit from here and you got to get this one from there and the team it, sh- it took forever and it shuffled around and there were 27 different schemes and we were there good lord it's a beautiful project i cannot believe it actually happened <laughs> right and it's one of those things where I look back on that project and I think it was worth it. Yeah. Like it, it actually was worth it. I don't know how we made out on that project. I don't know if we made any money. <laughs> I mean, I know it was hard the whole time. Yeah. It was extremely difficult. There was a public art component oh, that we had to yeah. work with an artist. And I mean, that's cool, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, except when it isn't. Exactly. Except when exactly. it isn't cool. Right? <laughs> exactly. And I totally and There's all these competing ideas yeah. and, 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 execution is difficult and there's all of these things and it's on a prominent corner and how do you address the corner but the entry is on the other side it was like just there's so many difficulties and constraints and things you're dealing with all the way through and at the end like it's an amazing project it looks and functions amazingly and i cannot believe that we pulled it off And, and so when i'm asking you this question like is there is there the project where it's it turns out like jazz, but it was a freaking disaster oh, yeah. the whole time. It just felt oh, yeah. like the, you're listening to a seventh grade band play, right? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what it feels like when you're doing it. And then at the end, it's like this amazing piece of music. It's this amazing piece of architecture. Yeah. And uh, and I've experienced that too. And I'm just like, how did that even happen? I don't even... Yeah. And I, it's through sheer will and determination that it actually happens. And it's like because we care so much that we're not going to let it be just some stucco box on a corner mm. you know yeah you know what's interesting is i uh, we i was as part of the conversation that of that we were having today you know i i had said that the projects that i appreciated the most were the ones with the least amount of budget because it because you did the most with the least exactly I mean, exactly yeah. you learn to stretch your design dollar to like you know you, you didn't even know you could stretch a dollar that far and right. it taught you how to do things in tricks or things like that that stretch that dollar and it was just so amazing to be able to do projects like that because you're able to get creative with like yeah. it's like all right here's literally the kit of parts this is like you can go to home depot and buy every single bit of pieces that is going to go into this off building shelf. off the right. shelf but how you put it together how you assemble it how that symphony when half of your your baritones are hitting puberty <laughs> <laughs> well what's crazy is it's like you're all these bands use the same inst- instruments, yeah. Yeah. but what they do with them is all over the map oh, yeah. when it comes yeah. to to how it actually turns out sounding. Right? Yeah, don't even get me uh, started. We're beating the sound the sound analogy to death, but oh, yeah. it's it, it is it it happens, and I think it is interesting that we maintain the optimism over our careers to do the most with the least, yeah. or or striving to find the next piece of music yeah. you know yeah. that 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 really makes a mark that that really just leaves that indelible mark on you that you'll never forget i mean it doesn't happen often no. right but but when it does it's it's truly special oh yeah absolutely <laughs>